Getting the math correction correct has taken some significant trial and error. So on the left side here, we have our standard version of the device with the camera looking out. This is our active range. And then over here, we have our modified version where our active range is actually here. And the challenge is that we need to map this range. So the camera still thinks that it's reading this range and is reporting as if it's reading this, but it's actually measuring along here when we bounce it off the mirror. The other wrinkle, which is not in this particular diagram, is that that mirror is actually some distance in front. So this beam is actually not originating from the same point. It's originating there, going straight, then taking a turn and going out to the left, which affects where it intersects and the, the way that these meet. So basically what we need to do is map what the camera thinks that it's reading onto what it's actually reading. And you can't just do that with a linear stretch because the camera is measuring, the pixels are mapped basically in steady angular increments. So if we switch to a drawing with that, where these are arranged in regular increments, so this distance here is now actually this one. But if we come up here and we look at this taller one, that this goes to be maybe triple. So it goes from this distance here to all of this. So there's a nonlinear mapping between these. The origin of the camera is actually back down here. So it's another 99 point whatever millimeters below the front surface of this and then 224 off of uh, this corner. That's the origin of the camera. So we have to deal with the origin of the camera and then where the laser is actually originating when we calculate all of these things. So that's where you see some of these numbers here, like 224. If you change the angle of this mirror, this line will actually swing back further to decrease that base distance. We have an empirical measurement where I said the device indicated that it thought it was 250 millimeters. This is the readout, which means it's actually 400 in front because it reads off a neutral point in front of it. It thinks it's 400 millimeters in front of it, it's actually, when you measure it with a tape measure, 508. So I have here an empirical, it thinks it's got this, the actual is this. And then what I want to do is develop a mathematical model that matches this reality. This is our empirical data here. This is our theoretical. This is the best fit for this to help me then apply the results, but we need these to match. So if I increase the mirror angle to say two degrees, for example, that helps out if I increase it to four. Well, I should jump back also because I tried just applying mirror angles. So you start off with, I tried a four degree angle and it was giving me very odd results. It was giving me this wave pattern. You see that? And I thought that maybe this actually had to do with gravity affecting the mirror since it's kind of hanging out there a little bit. But I wasn't super hopeful on that. This is a fairly aggressive curve. So I tried some different angles. There's five degrees, <laughs> six degrees, and seven degrees. And all of them still have that pattern, the you know concaveness or whatever you want to call it can change a little bit depending on how aggressive it is. But obviously, if you look at just the seven degree, for example, this door is hugely warped and it just doesn't doesn't make any sense. But what we need to do then is apply that nonlinear mapping that I talked about over here. This is when I started to realize it. So we need to experiment with this and you end up, for example, at like six degrees. And this is starting to look pretty good, but do you notice we're undershooting here and we're overshooting here and we haven't added in that mirror distance. So we can start to bump this up, which actually decreases it. And you can look at the diagram to see why that is. So then this now allows us to maybe crank this up, for example, which is now overshooting. So if you experiment with this, you end up at 6.8 and actually 100 was the number that I settled on. This is kind of weird because 100 millimeters is definitely further then the mirror is out in front of the device. It's about double what I think it should be, maybe even triple. I haven't figured out exactly why that is, but at this point, 
it's accurate enough that I'm not willing to, to fight out the details. But I switched into the kitchen and I was scanning against the ceiling line to see that. So this, the kitchen table's down here. This is the top of a window. And you can see here the start of a, the line against the ceiling. So if we look on this angle, you can see that it still has that characteristic wave. But when we come over here and apply one of these better scaling models to correct for that, you end up with this, which is a big improvement. Much, much straighter. Feeling good about that. We do have this lean inwards, but we'll come back to that right now. For the moment, <laughs> the wall's getting straighter. Things are better. We are not scaling it in the Z direction here. So when we add that in, which was also a little bit tricky, but anyway, we got that sorted out. It looks pretty good. Furthermore, it doesn't just look correct. If you take a tape measure and measure this, you'll get about 3362 millimeters, so 3.36 millimeters from wall to wall. So if I come in here and measure this to determine if it's accurate, I'll just pick a random point there and then a point over here. I mean, in this case, it depends on where you pick it. The last one was actually a coincidence. It was right on the money, so it looked like I faked it. <laughs> this one's a little more realistic. I mean, we're less than an inch off, and given the coarseness of the corrections that we are making right now, I feel quite good about that. I also implemented the dynamic exposure control. So when you go from the white trim over here, it's actually not in the scan, but if you do hit that and you go to a dark area, it'll triple the exposure. It doesn't work super well if part of it's dark and part of it's light. So for that, you need multiple exposure control. This is our scan here. We can see the curtain quite well with all of its contours and then the wall. And the wall is looking fairly straight, but we still have that lean in issue. It's the distance between here and here is 33.51 millimeters, and then here and here is just about 200 more. And that's a problem because if we start stacking these when they rotate, they really don't match up correctly. Basically what's happened here is that the mirror is rotated when it's installed, or in its location that it's installed on the go-cater. So it's not bouncing the light correctly it's bouncing it further in one case than the other. So what we actually need is a different range correction between the top of this line and the bottom of the line. In order to pull that off, I have a mirror rotation correction, which is just a compounding of the other ones. So actually at the top of the view, I determined that it was about 8.7 degrees with a 90 millimeter offset and 8.3 at the bottom in the correction Python program is actually calculate both and then weight it depending on where it is in the line in order to correct it. So once you do all that stuff and you go down all the roads to do it wrong in between, you end up with this scan. We can see here the difference that at the top it was about correct. If you remember earlier, we measured it closer to the top and it was pretty correct, but at the bottom it was too large. So here's the corrected version and we can see that it looks much straighter still not perfect, a little bit of wave, but also these walls can be a little bit funky here sometimes. So not all of that is gonna be due to my program having an issue. We have where we're looking higher. You can see here that these corners are matching up really well. Feeling pleased with that, it matches up on there. If we come around to the back, it yeah, there's a lot of noise here due to the window frame, but I think you get the idea, it looks good. We bring in the lower angles and then down below as well. But we do have some mismatch over here, which we'll be able to see better later. But overall, tell you what, the floor here, you can see where this, the, the bottom scan, this is very dark flooring, got a poor return here because it was trying to get a good return off this and this. So that's where that multiple exposure would come in handy. There's a hat that's sitting on some leaves for the table. It really impresses me how much you can actually see the thing based on these quote unquote depth measurements because you get a poor return sometimes in these darker areas of the striped wallpaper. 
These point clouds are fun, but what I really want is a surface to work with. So I'm going to select all of these and then I'm going to merge them down to one point cloud. And then I'm going to resample the point cloud. I'm actually going to bring this to about eight millimeters or a third of an inch. This drops the point density down to about one third of what it was before. And then now we can go ahead and make a mesh out of it. It takes a little bit to calculate this 3D Poisson one. The surface looks a little bit funky at the beginning here. <laughs> I guess it's trying to solve it to made up to a certain plane, but through the power of the internet, I learned about filtering. We can actually filter in some of the more aggressive distance filling operations. Here is a mesh, which we actually, I think it looks better. Yeah, if I turn off the point, so this is just the mesh. You can see our overlap errors where it's not quite lining up perfectly. But right now, I feel fine with that. I mean, given the fact that I have this mirror double-sided tape to a piece of wood that's clamped on there, once I get back to the full workshop set up in roughly a month or so, I'll be able to machine some blocks and experiment better with mounting that on there. I also looked into some uses. They use prisms in forestry. They also use them for ophthalmic correction to help people, I guess, with lazy eye and things like this where they're not pointed in the correct direction. So I was able to find some much larger prisms to experiment with. It seems like they wouldn't use those if it created a, a distortion of the image coming through. Anyway, they're fairly affordable and figured I'd pick some up and experiment. So I haven't given up on the prism thing yet. I appreciate the suggestions that people have put in so far. Make some other improvements to the mechanism. It's currently rocking slightly when it changes direction. The plug on the outside also is kind of a mess. I didn't want to spend the money to buy the correct one, so I was goofing around with just sort of spring-loading the wires in place. But they pop out sometimes, which is very frustrating. And it's time to bite the bullet and, and do the correct thing, so I'm going to have to get that locked down. That's it for now. Thank you for watching.